Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 17. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 17. If you have your Bibles with you, please follow along. If not, you can follow along on the screen beside me. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 17. Receive now God's word. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reveled, we blessed. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Spent a little bit of time this past week trying to figure out the difference between the word admonishment versus admonition, admonishment, admonition, and maybe one of the English majors can correct me after service, but as far as I can tell, and I tried Googling it, as far as I can tell, there doesn't actually seem to be a difference. They seem to be the same word. And as you can see, I chose to stick with admonishment for the sermon title because if you take a look in your Bibles in verse 14 of our passage, the word admonish appears, and there is an S-H in that word. And there's an S-H in admonishment. And so that's what it came down to for me. Not so much of a grammatical reason, more of an aesthetic reason. Either way, it doesn't really matter what word I use in the English. What's more important is what it says in the Greek. And in the Greek, the verb for admonish is nuthateo. It means to counsel about avoidance or cessation of an improper course of conduct. To counsel about avoidance or cessation of an improper course of conduct. And this is really what our entire passage is all about. It is Paul's counsel to the Corinthian church to immediately cease an improper course of conduct in which they are presently engaged. If you've been with us for the last couple of months or even weeks, then you should know exactly what that misconduct is. It is the quarreling and the factionalism that has divided this church. If you turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, we see there what prompted this whole discussion to begin with. Paul writes, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. This larger section, chapters 1 through 4, The whole thing has essentially been Paul's response to Chloe's report. Now flip a couple pages over in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. There it says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. As you can see, starting in chapter 5, or technically starting in chapter 4, verse 18, And I'll explain why I'm treating that with the following passage next week. But starting with chapter 5, Paul will be addressing another report. 
And so starting next week, we'll be entering a new major section in this letter. Obviously, that means our passage today concludes our present section. And having now come to the end of his response, Paul goes straight for the root issue that is underlying the Corinthian factions. In fact, this is the root issue for virtually every sin, and that is the issue of pride. So the main idea, if you will, of this passage is Paul's admonishment against the Corinthians' pride. That's what this passage is about. And if we're going we're to be taking a look at it under three headings. Number one, an accusation of arrogance. Number two, arrogance contrasted to humility. And number three, a call to imitate humility. Those would be our three points. But before we get into the text, let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, we come before your word in order to know more about you, in order to know more about ourselves. Uh, this morning, as we take a look at a text that addresses the issue of pride and arrogance, even as we incline our ears and our hearts to this word, may you destroy our pride, may you humble our hearts, and in humility may we receive this word. Perhaps for many of us, may we receive it as correction, and may we live a life that is more humble before you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 6. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. When Paul writes, I have applied all these things, that is referring back to everything that we've looked at since chapter 3, verse 5. That's when Paul started to talk about himself and Apollos. So recall the last couple of sermons. Paul described himself along with Apollos through a number of metaphors. They are servants, he said, diakonos, people who wait upon tables or perform unskilled labor. They're farmers planting and watering the field, construction workers carefully laying a foundation and building upon it, subordinates who parates, literally galley slaves, shackled in chains, rowing day and night, more generally someone who is subordinate to a superior. And last but not least, stewards, people entrusted with managing their master's property. As I've mentioned before, all of these terms are demeaning metaphors. They are descriptive of men who belong to a lower social class. And so Paul writes that he applied all these things, as in all these metaphors, to themselves for the benefit of the Corinthian church. He restrained from applying these things directly to the members of the church, perhaps the leaders of each individual faction, because he knew that it would be offensive to them, to their proud ears, being called a diakonos would have been abrasive. And of course, that's part of the issue. It's their pride. In the following phrases, Paul spells out the benefit that he has in view. That you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. That's not entirely clear what Paul's referring to there, but I think we get a pretty good clue by that phrase, what is written. Paul uses that verb written about 30 times in all of his letters. And in every single case, it is used to either refer to or to introduce a citation from the Old Testament scripture. We have no reason to think that our verse is an exception. So the Corinthians are not to go beyond what is written as in what scripture has to say. And I think we can be more specific. In the first three chapters of this letter, Paul has quoted six Old Testament scripture. Let me read through each of those quotations for you. And as I do, try to see if you can identify what they all have in common. The first citation was made in chapter 1, verse 19. Paul wrote, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Second, in verse 31 of chapter 1, As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 9, but as it is written, 
what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Chapter 2, verse 16, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Chapter 3, verse 19, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And last but not least, chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So what do all of those scripture citations have in common? All of them talk about the foolishness of man's wisdom versus the wisdom of God, right? So more specifically, Paul is admonishing this church not to go beyond what scriptures has to say regarding wisdom. To put that differently, they are not to boast in men. They are not to boast in themselves. Rather, they are to boast in God alone. This interpretation of that phrase is confirmed by the very next phrase. That none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. That's basically another way of saying the same thing. Paul is not introducing there a second idea. Rather, he is elaborating upon the previous clause. What he means by not going beyond scripture is that none might be puffed up. And here we come to our first point. Paul's accusation against the Corinthians of arrogance. The Greek word for puffed up literally means to inflate something with air. The Corinthians, to put it crassly, was full of themselves. And that's why they were rallying around these leaders in favor of one another. It was a means to greater status. It was a means to further inflate their already puffed up egos. Even beyond our passage, based upon what Paul says in the rest of this letter, it is evident that arrogance was a serious problem in this church. Again, if you have your Bibles with you, take a look at verse 18, just right after our passage. Paul writes, some are arrogant. Then verse 19, I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people. Later in chapter 5, verse 2, and you are arrogant. Chapter 5, verse 6, your boasting is not good. Chapter 8, verse 1, all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up. And chapter 13, verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. This was an arrogant church. Now, when you read through Paul's letters, you'll see from time to time that Paul can get really worked up. There are certain things that makes him not just angry, but absolutely furious. And I think you can tell by the tone in the following verses that this is one of those things. Arrogance. Spiritual pride. As I've already said, this isn't just one sin among many sins. This is the root of all sins. It is pride that led Adam to eat of the forbidden fruit. It is pride that led David to take Bathsheba. It is pride that led the Sanhedrin to crucify their Messiah. It is pride that led Saul of Tarsus to once persecute the church. And it is pride that is presently tearing this church apart. You ought to know this. A proud church can never be a united church. It is impossible. And this is simply because of what pride is. Pride says, I will put myself before everyone else. And when you have 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people all saying, I will put myself before everyone else, what do you suppose you're going to get? It's common sense. Quarreling and division. What you're going to get is the Corinthian church. I like how one theologian put it. He said, pride has antisocial consequences. And that's true, isn't it? If you go to a party and there's that guy who is really arrogant, nobody wants to be around him. His presence ruins the whole party. Everyone knows arrogance when they see it, and everyone is turned off by it. It has antisocial consequences. And within the context of a church, that spells out the destruction of fellowship. It destroys unity. Well, let me state the obvious here. 
The only person's pride that you can do anything about is that of yourself. You cannot do anything about someone else's pride. You can admonish them at best, like Paul is doing here, but you can't change their hearts. The point being, it starts with you and with no one else. If you want your church to be a more humble church, it has to start with you. You have to become more humble. That is the only way. Well, let's take a closer look at the Corinthians' arrogance. Verse 7, this is where Paul's language really starts to ramp up. Verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Paul begins with three questions. Who, what, and why? First, who? Who sees anything different in you? That's tantamount to saying, what's so special about you anyways? Who made you better than everyone else? John Chrysostom of the 4th century put it like this. He said, where is the evidence that you are worthy of being praised? Here is where pride begins. It begins with an improper knowledge of yourself. First, your focus is turned inward. Second, as you look inward, you begin to define yourself according to what you think distinguishes you. This is what Paul is getting at. Who sees anything different or who sees anything distinct in you? Think about how this applies to you. Aren't we also tempted to boast or to be proud of those things that distinguish us? Don't we also think to ourselves, I'm better because I'm a doctor. I'm better because I have a PhD. I'm better because I make more money than everyone else. What distinction makes you especially proud? The second question is what? What do you have that you did not receive? Paul says, let's just say that you are special. Let's just say that there are lots of things that distinguish you. Even so, wasn't it all given to you in the first place? As we'll see in the weeks to come, one of the things, believe it or not, that made the Corinthians especially proud was their spiritual gifts. Paul even acknowledged in chapter 1, you are enriched in all speech and knowledge. You are not lacking in any gift. But now Paul would like to say, but didn't you receive them? Did you earn them? Did you cultivate them yourselves? Did the Holy Spirit look at you and say, my, what a talented man he is. I'd better give him all these spiritual gifts. Of course not. The mere thought is absurd, and that is the point, because pride is absurd. If only the Corinthians had learned from Paul, who, though he was an apostle, was never prideful of being an apostle, for he was always mindful of the fact that he was appointed to this position by God. Later in chapter 9, Paul will say, If I preach the gospel... That gives me no ground for boasting. Just because I'm the preacher, just because I'm the one instructing you, doesn't give me any right to be arrogant. And here's his reason. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Did you catch his logic there? Necessity is laid upon me. God has called me to preach so that it's not an option for me. In fact, if I don't preach, woe to me. That's another way of saying, then I'll be judged. Paul continues, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. So he goes on to say, it'd be one thing if I was such a great guy, if I was really smart, really sacrificial. And so I decided out of the greatness of my own heart to preach the truth to you free of charge. But he's being honest here. That's not why I'm doing this. Paul says, I do it because God told me to do it. And if I'm simply doing what I'm supposed to be doing, what's there to boast about? Where's the room for pride? Cephas applies this to all believers. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. 
as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So it's not just the apostles who are stewards. The Corinthians were pitting Paul against Peter. But there was only agreement between those two. They were marvelously consistent with each other in their teachings. If you're a steward, how can you boast over the things with which you've been given and entrusted? What do you have that you did not receive? The question is rhetorical. The answer is nothing. And that statement is exhaustive. There is nothing that you have not received. I hope you can see then what that implies about this thing called pride. If you are proud, then in effect you are saying to God, I did not receive X, Y, and Z from you. Pride is a denial of God's grace. This naturally leads Paul to ask his third question. Why? Why then? Do you boast as if you did not receive it? How would you answer that question? Why then do you boast as if you did not receive it? Apply it to yourself. Why do you boast about those things that you think distinguish you? What's the answer to that question? The answer is actually, I don't know. You can sense Paul's frustration. I just don't get it. If you know that everything is given to you, then why are you boasting? He's perplexed. You see, boasting makes no sense. If you're a believer, there is no reasonable explanation for boasting. As I said a moment ago, pride is absurd. Verse 8, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings And would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. If you're not sensing the sarcasm here, then you really do need to read some more books or something, because this is as sarcastic as you're going to find Paul anywhere in his letters. That first phrase, already you have all you want, literally says, already you are full. The word that Paul uses is a word that's associated with eating. It means to be full or satiated as a result of you stuffing your face. And it's funny because we use the same figure of speech in Korean. We say, you must be very full in a biting and sarcastic tone to someone who doesn't know what it's like to be in need, to someone who's self-sufficient, self-content. This is, this is the exact opposite attitude of what Jesus promotes in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is the exact opposite attitude of Paul, who says in Philippians chapter 3, not that I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Paul was always hungry, and therefore he was always striving for perfection. He never once thought to himself, I've made it. I'm fully mature. I've got nothing else to attain unlike these Corinthians. This reminds us, of course, of Paul's previous critique when he said in chapter 3, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. You see, the Corinthians thought to themselves, we must be wise. They thought that they were very mature. And for that very reason, Paul considered them immature. The same idea is reiterated in the following statements. Already you've become rich. Without us, you've become kings. And again, we have a similar figure of speech, this time in English. We say, who made you king? Similar rhetoric. It is very possible that Paul is here borrowing from the Stoic philosophers who taught that the wise man was to be considered and treated like a king. And so Epictetus, for example, the famous Stoic philosopher who lived right after Paul, by the way, Epictetus once said, Who, when he lays eyes upon me, does not feel that he is seeing a king? There is humility for you, right? Still in verse 8, this is my favorite part in this whole passage. 
Would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. I mean, seriously, don't you just love how Paul can speak like this to the arrogant Corinthians? He says, I wish you were kings. I wish you were that mature. I wish you were perfect. Because if you were, that would mean Christ had come back and I'd be sharing the rule with you guys. But if that's the case, what the heck am I doing here suffering like this? You think I'm doing this for fun? You think I'm living like a beggar out of preference? No way. I'd rather be ruling with you guys. David Garland, New Testament scholar, summarizes Paul's point in verse 8 like this. He writes, The Corinthians already see themselves as morally and spiritually perfected without having to experience the bodily struggles which Paul sees as the sign of life in Christ. They do not reign as kings because they are not wise according to the cross. The king reigns from the cross, which displays the only wisdom that counts with God. I want you to think about that. The Corinthians saw themselves as morally and spiritually perfected without having experienced the bodily struggles which Paul is about to elaborate upon. If you think yourself wise, if you think yourself mature, but you have yet to endure any kind of suffering in Christ, if you have yet to carry out your own cross, then you are a fool. Even Christ had to suffer to death in order to be glorified. So are you greater than Christ himself that you can just skip the humiliation, that you can skip the sufferings, that you don't need to overcome the temptations and the tests and the trials before you are molded into his image, before you're glorified? Are you greater than Christ? No, the Corinthians are not yet kings. We just looked at Paul's accusation of arrogance and now point number two, the arrogance of the Corinthians contrasted to the humility of the apostles. Verse 9. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. The image that Paul paints here is borrowed from the gladiator games. The phrase sentenced to death is actually a translation of a single word, epithanatios, and that's a word that was often used to describe the men who were thrown to the lions. It is also reminiscent of a common phrase that the gladiators were compelled to say before each fight. If you've seen the movie Gladiator, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Before each fight, the gladiators look to the emperor, they raise their right hand, and they say, we who are about to die salute you. And of course, that scene stands out because every time they say it, Maximus refuses to say that to the emperor. We who are about to die. That is the same verb. Men sentenced to death. Epithanatios. Now what's striking about this analogy is that Paul says it is God who has exhibited us. It is God who has made us become a spectacle to the world both angels and men. So the apostles are on this grand stage. Think of the Colosseum. And there's this cosmic audience that is watching. And what are they watching? They're watching the apostles suffer. Listen to one historian's explanation of the games. The last and climactic event on the program was the criminals facing capital punishment. They had to appear and fight to the death, but of course, they could not win every combat. And their bloodied bodies would eventually weaken until humiliation and death overtook them. Bloodied and weakened until humiliation and death overtook them. That's what happened to the apostles in real life, isn't it? With the exception of John, all of them were brutally executed. 
Now let me read for you Paul's description of his hardships. Verse 10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. As an aside, that contrast between Paul and the Corinthians, the fact that it's coming within this analogy of the games, almost seems to portray the Corinthians as the spectators. They're the ones seated in their lofty stands, drinking wine, eating fruits, watching the apostles fight it out to the death. Paul continues in verse 11, To the present hour we hunger and thirst, we are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reveled we bless, when persecuted we endure, when slandered we entreat, we have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. To repeat myself, it is God who has arranged this exhibition. Why on earth would God do this to his servants? Paul is not a stranger to lists. He creates a similar catalog of hardships in a number of passages, such as Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 11, Philippians 4. In each of those passages, Paul's point is not to brag about how much he suffered on behalf of Christ. But Paul's point is to show how his life is virtually a mirror image of the life of Christ. You're meant to read this list and think, that sounds a lot like the way that Jesus lived. You see, Paul's saying, my hardships, they're not accidental. This is by God's design. He has called us for the express purpose of reflecting Christ, reflecting the cross. And if you're thinking ahead, you'll see that this is the basis of his call to the Corinthians to therefore imitate me, he will say. Another theologian, Roy Kiampa, puts it like this. Paul regards these experiences not merely as misfortune or trials to be surmounted, but as identifying marks of the authenticity of his apostleship. God exhibited the apostles last of all, so that in the apostles, that fundamental principle of the Christian faith that Jesus taught to his disciples the original apostles, so that that fundamental principle might be displayed. The first shall be last, and the last first. Within the Christian hierarchy, so to speak, it is those who are humbled in this life who will be exalted in the life to come. That's the order that God has instituted. I want to highlight just a couple of things in this catalog for you. Paul starts off by listing three contrasts. We are fools, you are wise. We are weak, you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. And that should remind you of what Paul has said earlier in chapter 1, verse 27. You can turn there if you have your Bibles. Chapter, tw chapter 1, verse 27, Paul wrote, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So we have here a recap, a basic repetition of Paul's discussion on wisdom. This is followed by six tribulations. We hunger and thirst, we're poorly dressed, we're buffeted, homeless, and we labor with our hands. Notice the way that Paul is setting up the apostles in direct juxtaposition with the Corinthians. Just a moment ago, Paul had said to the Corinthians, you are full. Well, the apostles are hungry and thirsty. You are rich. Well, the apostles are poorly dressed, buffeted, and homeless. You are kings. Well, the apostles labor with their hands. To be buffeted, by the way, means to be struck by someone's fist, to be beat up. To be homeless means to be a wanderer. You shouldn't think of homeless people today. That's not quite the same concept. Rather, homelessness is pointing to the apostles' lifestyle of being strangers and sojourners in this world. They were constantly wandering because they were always on a mission and they did not consider this world their home. 
They were homeless. And to labor with one's hands undoubtedly is an allusion to Paul's craft of being a tent, tent maker. He spent much of his days in his cramped workshop, bent over on his stool, working alongside other workers, even slaves. Kiampa again writes that Paul suffered the artisan's lack of status. The list is then rounded off by three more items, this time underscoring the manner in which the apostles respond to mistreatment. When reveled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. And again, we hear an echo of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, blessed are you when others revel you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. In other words, slander against you on my account. Paul is basically quoting the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, all of these items remind us of Christ, don't they? Especially in his passion. Christ was hungry and thirsty and stripped naked. He was beaten and reveled and persecuted. He was made like the scum of the world when quite literally he died the death of a scum, of a lowly criminal. That's as much as I'll say about this list. But I want you to now consider the impact that this would have had on the Corinthians. How do you think they felt when they opened this letter and they started reading through it and then they got to this passage? It must have cut them to the heart. I mean, they must have felt so silly that they were being so boastful that they were living such worldly lives when their self-proclaimed leaders were willing to be made so low. The fact that such a drastic difference exists between the Corinthians and the apostles is a scathing rebuke, right? And now I wonder what kind of impact this list has upon you. The application here isn't rock and science. This is really easy. When you set yourself against the life of Christ, so compare, there's not meant to be a drastic difference. If there is, and so you're feeling guilty, then good. Hopefully it's a guilt that is being produced, not by me, but by this text. And if it is, then understand that that is the Spirit using His Word to tug at your heart and to compel you to do something about it, to change, to stop living according to the wisdom of the world, to start living according to the wisdom of God. Now, there's not meant to be a drastic difference. There's meant to be mirror reflection. There has to be. Just as you could look at the apostles and see Jesus, people should be able to look at you and see Jesus. And this leads us to our third and final point, a call to imitate humility. Verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We have been assuming as much this entire time, but Paul now explains. I'm not trying to embarrass you here, but to admonish you as a father to his child. He is clearly aware, right, of the fact that his previous comments have been sharp and critical. So he now pulls back a bit. He checks his frustration. This reminds us of what Paul teaches elsewhere in Ephesians 6 where he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It is possible for your admonishment to be over the top, for it to permanently push your children away rather than bringing them back. And so Paul exercises great restraint as he now more gently explains the basis of his admonishment. 
he is compelled to write these harsh words to very bluntly correct the Corinthians because they are his beloved children. In other words, this is his parental obligation. As Hebrews 10 says, for what kind of children are not disciplined by their parents? This is Paul's burden to bear. He is aware of the fact that no one else can do this but him. He further explains why in verse 15, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So this is his obligation by virtue of the fact that he's the one who brought them to Christ. As he said in chapter 3, he's the one who planted. He's the one who laid the foundation. As it says in Acts, Paul spent 18 months with this church. What he's underscoring is a fact that there's not many people who could possibly love the Corinthians the way that he does. You have countless guides in Christ, but not many fathers. That's an understatement. They only have one father, Paul. That literally says you have 10,000 guides, an idiom for an innumerable amount. The word for guides is paedagogos. There's not really an English equivalent for that word. In the Greco-Roman world, a paedagogos was either a slave or a hired hand who was paid to accompany your child wherever he or she went. For example, he would walk the child to and from school, more generally, he was there to protect and supervise the child's behavior. Now, in Paul's time, there was a stereotype of these guardians. And the stereotype was that they were stern, ignorant, and uncaring, which isn't surprising since they were paid to watch this child. There was no relational obligation. This is likely a disparaging remark aimed at some of the leaders in Corinth who are manipulating this church in order to exalt themselves to gain higher status. And Paul would remind the Corinthians, you may have many guides. You may have lots of leaders. They might stand out from a worldly perspective. I don't know what kind of nonsense they're teaching you, but don't forget you only have one father. There is no one who loves you like I do. See, this is a plea to therefore receive his correction, to trust that he says what he says out of the deepest concern for their welfare. And so one scholar put it like this, this is Paul's way of expressing the intense care and love he feels towards the Corinthians. When I read that quote, that one word in particular stuck out to me, intense that's true, isn't it? Love is intrinsically intense as an emotion. If it wasn't, if love wasn't intense, it wouldn't be love. Think about that for yourself. Think about someone you love. If he or she did something terribly, terribly wrong, if she was doing something that was clearly harmful, wouldn't that evoke some kind of intense emotion in your heart? And I hope you're connecting the dots now. This is the basis of Paul's admonishment. You may have read this passage at first and thought to yourself, man, this is kind of over the top. Why is Paul getting so worked up? Well, he's getting so worked up because he genuinely loves this church. The intensity of his rebuke is directly proportionate to the intensity of his love. And not just his love. But God's love, this is worth keeping in mind when you're reading through the Bible. Every time you come across a passage, whether in the Old or New Testament, and you see God, or you see God's prophets reacting to God's people in furious anger, understand where that intensity is coming from. God is not like a paedagogos who stands aloof and could really care less when you make mistakes, when you sin. God cares, and he cares to the point that he sends his son to die on the cross. His love for you is intense. 
So his anger is also intense when you sin. Now here's the call. Verse 16. I urge you then be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. You might think that this is arrogant for him to say something like, be imitators of me. But it wouldn't have sounded arrogant to the Corinthians because, one, it was established, it was the established norm for teachers to teach as much by example as with their words back then. And two, within the present analogy, it is only natural for the child to emulate the parent. It is not arrogant for a parent to say, imitate me to his or her child. Furthermore, I want you to pay attention to the way in which Paul intends the Corinthians to imitate him. He is actually not expecting them to imitate him directly. That is why I sent you Timothy, he says. And notice the description of Timothy. My beloved and faithful child. That is the same exact way he described the Corinthians, as his beloved children. So don't botch the application here at the very end. The Corinthians are to imitate Timothy because Timothy imitates Paul because Paul imitates Christ. You see that chain, don't you? As Paul will say in chapter 11, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so here's what that implies. The Corinthians aren't supposed to imitate Paul just because he happens to be an apostle. Imitation is not an exclusive prerogative of the apostles. It is meant to be applicable to all believers. Paul expects the Corinthians to imitate Timothy, not an apostle, so that other people can imitate the Corinthians. So this command, be imitators of me, implicitly includes the exhortation to the Corinthians, be worthy of imitation. Here's a good test for you of whether or not you are faithfully living the Christian life. Can you say to the person sitting next to you, imitate me? And you can't say that unless your conscience is clean and unless you're confident in the spirit that is living in you. You can't say that. This isn't meant to be discouraging either. And let me close with this thought. It is not right. It is not right for you to think to yourself, boy, I don't think I could ever say that. Imitate me, who the heck am I to say something like that? That sounds humble, but it's not. What that is, is a failure to acknowledge the fact that the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. This is amazing if you think about it. Not only was Paul so faithful in his own walk with Christ, but he was such a good mentor that he was able to reproduce another believer in Timothy who replicated his faithfulness. That's good discipleship. When you can say, if Timothy's there, I'm there. It's the same thing. But that's not to compliment Paul because it didn't begin with Paul. It began with Christ. And isn't this what Christ does? He is the most faithful, the most wise, the most loving mentor you could have. He is in the business of reproducing little Christ's representatives and ambassadors of himself. And my teacher, Jesus Christ, is so good and so effective 
at discipling me that when I'm here, Jesus is here. You ought to strive to be worthy of imitation. And as you strive, don't trust in your own power. Trust in the one who's working in you. Trust that he will enable you to say, along with the Apostle Paul, imitate me. Let's pray. O merciful Father in heaven, we thank you that you are, in fact, our Father. And as a good Father, you are also a good teacher. You are our role model. You are our professor. You are the one who holds us by our hands and leads us to walk in a way that is reflective of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we confess that in our sin, far too many times we look nothing like your son. For that, we repent and we ask for your forgiveness. We even confess that at times it seems totally hopeless that we might imagine. It almost seems arrogant that we might imagine that we would be worthy of imitation and yet not by our strength but by yours we are able to reflect the glory of Christ to this world and to those who are lost. Help us, we pray, as a church, to be a church when those who do not know you walk into our doors, that in us they might see Jesus Christ and come to a saving faith in him. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.